Welcome to the podcast. I'm your friendly host at Starting Strength, Mark Ripito. With us today is our friend in Cleveland, Ohio, Counselor Brody Butland. Brody has uh, been very helpful to us in the Starting Strength community with uh, the uh, generous donation of his wisdom and intelligence to a common problem that those of us in the health and fitness business run into a lot of times, and that is waiver. And uh, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about that a little more later. Uh, but I think first we wanted to talk about uh, the big decision with respect to state licensure. Uh, Brody's sure written extensively on this. We have a couple of articles, uh, both on uh, SchardingStrength.com and in an article I wrote for Teen Nation regarding state licensure for uh, personal trainers, health and fitness professionals, that sort of thing. And Brody's been in on this from the, from the inception uh, in our discussions about this. So Brody, get us up to date, man. Well, sure. And I think maybe the best way to start is to provide a little background. So since 2010, five states in the District of Columbia have proposed licensure of personal trainers, state-required licensure. Uh, D.C. actually passed a law. It, it wasn't just in the legislative process. They actually passed it, and it was supposed to go into effect in 2013. A uh, couple delays occurred, and uh, eventually they, they tabled the bill in large part because of the efforts of CrossFit, which did a uh, full-court press on the D.C. City Council. And uh, and the other you know the other states have not really gone in uh, they they have not gone up for a vote, uh, and I think probably lobbying from the personal training industry is largely responsible for that. Um, well, lobbying from certain aspects of the personal training certification industry uh, was initially responsible for the whole damned idea to begin with. Well, and that's yes. true. That yeah, that is the uh, that is U.S. reps. Uh, which is the uh, United States Registry of Exercise Professionals. And there are seven groups in there, and I don't remember all of them offhand, but I know ACE is one of them, ACSM, uh, Cooper Institute. Cooper and, Institute, uh, NSCA, mm -hmm. uh, NASM, uh, AFA, ACE. And, and then I think uh, Pilates is there too. Yeah, some, there's some Pilates, a bunch of criminal organizations who are basically so, trying but, to... Uh, you know, but and they've been the ones that have been driving this the entire yeah. time. It's never been it's never been individual personal trainers. It's oh, never no. been consumers. It's always been sort of this, uh, you know, group from. It's been this this group from on high that has uh, explained tried to explain why this would be good. Well, um, their their explanation has been it would be good because it would ensure work for people with our certification and for people who grant our certifications. That's the net reason for the whole thing. It is a wait, jobs wait, program. Wait. These people, these people have been willing to use the power of the government to sell their products and make them mandatory for you people in this industry to have. And that is bullshit. Wait, wait, wait Rep, are, are you suggesting that maybe their motives aren't safety? Perhaps I am suggesting that. Actually, I'm not suggesting that. What I'm saying is that these people are, are a bunch of criminals, and they need to be shut down. <clears throat> and for, for those of you listening, anyone of you guys who are members of these organizations should drop your memberships just based on morality, because that's wrong. Mm -hmm. Well, and fortunately, the, uh, the pushback, primarily from CrossFit, but of course we've been involved in it as well, uh, has, I think, changed the discussion a little bit. Uh, U.S. reps has said that they are going to stop lobbying efforts. Now, whether that's true or not, I don't know. But well, they, they would have, have to disband because that's yeah. their only ostensible reason for existence. Well, but, you know. but either way, I mean, that is at least their official statement. And they did get it. I think they got embarrassed in D.C. So, uh, so I think that... Um, although I have no doubt that the licensure issue will come back in the future, I have no doubt that uh, it will be proposed in some state. My guess is Massachusetts is probably the most likely, just given the frequency that bills have shown up there. 
but as long as uh, but but I think that we are in a you know at least for right now we're in sort of a good calm period, and uh, but I I will say to all those who are listening. Um, try to monitor your state legislature however you can, because the D.C. law really flew under the radar. Nobody really knew about yes. it until after it was passed. Do not relax. They will try this again. It's the only reason for their existence. And if this can be regulated and licensed and we can be dictated to about what we can do and what we can't do as exercise professionals, then that's what's going to happen eventually. They will try it again. Do not relax. And, and I will also, a point that you made, which I want to follow up on, as to how important this really is, uh, pretty much every proposed law, there are a couple exceptions, but pretty much every proposed law and the model legislation proposed by U.S. reps, which they will actually hand to legislators and ask them to, that, to use something along these lines, they all require creation of a standards of practice. What that means is if you are doing something like, for example, teaching old people how to squat that do not that does not comply with what they believe is the industry standard, then you could be not only civilly liable, you could be criminally liable. And, or, uh, yeah, and or, I really or, or should or have. Your I, you're, you're absolutely right to mention that. I should have thrown that in earlier. If we're going to discuss the evils of licensure, we have to we have to stipulate to the evil, and the evil in this case is uh, that a nameless, faceless board of uh, exercise prescription examiners can tell you how to run your practice and can tell you what you can and cannot do in your gym with your clients. And, uh, you know, th th here, this is what it will boil down to. Who will be on the board in your state? Who will comprise the board of exercise prescription examiners in the state of Texas? And the board will be composed of the following people, orthopedic surgeons, physical therapists, a couple of lawyers, a couple of personal trainers, and probably a nurse or two. Mm -hmm. there, will be, there will be no one on the board that knows anything about what we do here in a barbell gym. And, Absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, and D.C. was a perfect example of that. D.C., the Department of Physical Therapy, was going to do all the licensure. It wasn't even a question of they were just a couple members of the board. They were running the whole thing. And, uh, and that's one of the reasons why there was such a pushback. The, the idea that why should, why should a group of people who specialize in disabled and frail rehabilitation be prescribing exercise for the generally healthy population. Who wants to get strong and fit? It, it's, just, it's just crazy, but that's the way it'll go because these are the people who are grabbing for this power. So, uh, as, as Brody said, it's, it's kind of been back right now, but don't, don't assume for a moment that this will go away. They will mm -hmm. be back, they're coming for your daughters. We, uh, we, yeah, we really did get lucky in D.C. It is much, as I'm sure you know, when laws are passed, it's very hard to put the genie back in the bottle. Yes, no, you and we actually, you know, we, we, we were able to do it in D.C. We actually got the law repealed, but the hope is that we never get to that point. And fortunately, in the other states, it's never gotten out of committee, in part because folks have been paying attention. Well, um, that's, the, that's a very good point. If we can keep it from getting out of committee in your state then it doesn't have to be dealt with anymore until it gets reintroduced in committee. But once the committee sees it two or three times and cogent arguments are made against it, the committee will quit listing it as, a, as an agenda item and it'll just go away. But uh, I predict that we will have problems of this for the foreseeable future and uh, that you people who are watching this, who are in this business, need to take it upon yourselves to be aware of what's going on in your state. This will all happen at the state level. I don't, and I, I'm sure Brody is in agreement with this, we, we don't see anything happening with regard to this sort of thing at the national level just because that pesky 10th Amendment gets in the way of some things. But it will happen at the state level, and you need to be aware of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
So, I, I, you know, thanks to, to Brody for his hard work on this. And I really think that we may have had a, a hand in putting this thing back in the box. I'll say, well, and you too. I mean, you wrote two articles on it. And, uh, you know, between between us and, uh, and and the efforts of CrossFit, I think, uh, I, I think that's what was able to stop it. Yes, excellent. So, uh, uh, what else are you working on? We've got uh, our convention coming up in, uh, in August, first weekend of August. We've moved it from October to August uh, for a couple of, of reasons, one of which is because more people can attend first week of August. There's not any school in the way, so uh, we're moving things up. What are you going to be talking about at the, uh, at the convention this year? Well, I think, and I haven't fully decided everything yet, but definitely going to be talking about uh, case updates for the past year, and there are a few interesting ones. Uh, going to talk about um, AED devices, because there are, last count, or last that I counted, there are 12 states that require not only that you have AEDs in your gym, but you also have training on how to use them. And I figure not only is it good if you're in one of the, if you're in one of those 12 states, but it probably will come to your state in the near future, these, mm-hmm. these kinds of uh, requirements. So it's sort of good to know what the industry is doing and try to get ahead of the game. Right. Um, so going to, going to talk about that and, uh, um, you know, and, and we'll see, uh, we'll see what else I can come up with, but should be, uh, should be about a, an hour of, uh, pure legal fun. Well, you know, I don't know, uh, that this, highly useful material is available anywhere else. So, uh, and we, you know, we may decide this year to, to tape this again, and we may decide to release this to the public uh, as a public service. But mm-hmm. uh, those of you guys who are starting strength coaches that are planning on being at the convention this year uh, will be privy to some stuff you're just not gonna be able to get elsewhere. Brody's previous contributions have been in the uh, in the field of uh, waiver for uh, for gym owners, tell us a little bit about that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sure. And uh, and actually, that's probably a topic I will cover is is waivers for online uh, training because that's sort of the online model is starting to become more popular, and uh, it has its own sets of issues that you don't have with a normal gym waiver, um, among other things, because you're across state lines. And uh, and you weren't physically there to watch the person unless you do some really weird like live time Skype or whatever. But uh, but I've never heard of that actually working. Nah, but in ter- very well. But but in terms of waivers, I mean the if you want to find an example of a bad waiver, just Google personal training waiver, and there's about a fifty percent chance that the waiver on the first page will be invalid in some way. <laughs> Uh, in fact, so the first presentation I gave, where I gave uh, four examples of waivers and how to fix them, uh, I found seven examples on the first page of Google of waivers that needed uh, fixing, based on uh, based on my examination of the research. So, bottom line is, don't. Uh, this is not the kind of thing I would recommend. Just you know, trying to do yourself based on internet research. You gotta you gotta know what you're looking for. Um, but the, uh, or, or just out of curiosity, are you available to help with it? Absolutely. And I've actually, I have done at least, I think 15 or 16 waivers for gyms at this point in a whole variety of contexts, just, uh, you know, home, uh, home gyms and, and home practice, um, folks who, uh, go to, who rent spaces, folks who do online training. Um, I, I basically run the gamut and it's email based address. On, I'm sorry? Email address. Uh, B. Butland, B B U T L A N D, at porterwright.com. P O R T E R W R I G H T. You guys are running a gym. Uh, this would be a real stupid place to try to save money. Uh, get this done correctly. It may save you far, 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 far more money than what you'll pay Brody for his expert advice on a waiver. Uh, a thing we are concerned about, and in fact, uh, the article on our website specifically dealing with this should appear uh, tomorrow. Uh, and uh, for those of you in the far distant future who are watching this podcast, uh, tomorrow would be, oh, what date is that in May? 
this, this, no, this is, this is the first. So that would be, and we're taping this on the first. So that would be, let me do the math. One plus seven is eight. May the, May the eighth, May the eighth uh, will be the date of this article. You guys are watching this on May the seventh. And uh, we are talking about the topic of pregnancy and training. Pregnancy and training in your gym. And uh, Brody and I were discussing this uh, a little bit last week, and uh, we're both in agreement that this has not been a problem heretofore, but in our increasingly litigious society, uh, it could be a problem. Uh, in other words, uh, what are the ramifications of you, the gym owner or personal trainer, coaching a pregnant female? How is the training best handled? and how is your liability best covered? Uh, and just in a nutshell, I'll go ahead and, and say that our advice has always been that uh, if you are, uh, are training, if you're a female who is currently training, been, a, been doing an actual strength training program and you get pregnant, go ahead and train. Uh, don't do anything stupid, you know, you might want to start to think about about the eighth month, about, about slowing things down. If you're in doubt, don't go for a PR, right? But if you are a woman who is, who, is, uh, who is pregnant and who is deciding about starting to train, our advice is to not do anything except simple exercise until you deliver. Because it just in a, in a nutshell, 30 to 50 percent of all pregnancies end in miscarriage. 30, 30 to 50 percent of all conceptions end in spontaneous abortion or miscarriage. And uh, this is a significant number. And it, what, it, what it actually means is that uh, if you are training a pregnant female and she miscarries in your gym, it's probably just because she's one of the 30 to 50 percent. But her attorney may not see it that way. And she may not see it that way. Uh, Brody, what are, your, what are your thoughts about this? I, I, well, I, I think that's accurate. And I actually did a search for case law to see if there is any case that has made its way through the system on this issue. And thus far, it doesn't look like anything has. That doesn't mean there haven't been any lawsuits in this regard. It just means that in the case of state courts, it hasn't made its way through the appellate system. And in the case of federal courts, there hasn't been a district court decision on it. Um, but I think it, 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 is a, it is potentially a problem. Um, if you have, uh, anytime you're dealing with someone who has a pre-existing condition, and, uh, you know, and I think in a certain sense, a pregnancy is a pre-existing condition. Um, it is possible that you could end up being sued if that condition worsens or, or has some problem while they're under the bar. And that's true whether they have, uh, whether they're prone to stroke or hemorrhage, which Dr. Sullivan has written a lot about. And I think that's true also if somebody's, uh, if someone's pregnant. And uh, and they and she has a miscarriage. So, you know, my suggestion on this is to, uh, if you know that somebody is pregnant, um, I would be a little bit careful. I'm not going to say you know handle this person with kid gloves because the, you know the, the, she may be a very formidable lifter, uh, and, and you don't want to you know you don't want to be one of those types that just tells her well now that you're pregnant you can't do anything. Oh no no. Absolutely but uh, not. you know and, I mean it, we certainly recommend against that. But what I would say is as you observe you know if if somebody's eight months pregnant maybe it's not a good idea to be coaching her through a PR. Right. Uh, and 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 uh, I mean, partly for partly just because uh, of liability, and partly because that's probably not something that you want on your hands. Right. Um, uh, and I would also suggest uh, I think that waivers can be drafted to include miscarriage as a potential uh, risk associated with training. And I think that they probably should. Uh, I just started thinking about this recently as a result of the fact that every seminar during our famous three-hour Q&A session on Sunday afternoon, someone frequently asks about this. What if I'm pregnant? Can I train? 
Well, if, uh, if you've been training, sure, you can train. And as Brody just said, once you're in your eighth month, perhaps the eighth month is not the time for a deadlift PR. Although I will admit that I have seen a nine month and like zero days pregnant girl PR the squat at 225 for two sets of five. I mean, <laughs> you know, she was crowning, right? And <laughs> the uh, and 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 she got out of the bar and just and just did a just two sets of five with two and a quarter PRs. And I thought, well, that's interesting. Uh, I wonder if I'll be named in the suit if she <laughs> runs back to the house tonight and hatches in the in the in the yard, you know, on the way into way in from the car. But I. Uh, I, so I, I have no doubt it can be done. We've coached, you know, those of us that have been in this business for a long time have coached pregnant women. And what we finally, uh, what we generally see is that uh, labor is, is greatly reduced in a, mm -hmm. in a girl that's been training for, for uh, the duration of her pregnancy. Uh, never seen any complications. But the mathematical certainty is that if you train, enough pregnant women, one of them is going to lose the pregnancy. And if it can be attributed to you, do you want to be in that position? And I think I'd like to have her perhaps sign something that absolves me, at least on paper, of that responsibility. In addition to the fact that you as trainers are not supposed to be doing stupid things anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to and use your own judgment on this. Oh, on this and also make sure your insurance is up to date. Uh, just, just, just because you have a waiver, doesn't mean it's not going to cost a lot to get through the suit. Right. So, um, so yeah, definitely insurance and waiver, uh, mm -hmm. assuming that you're in a state that uh, recognizes waivers, which most do. Um, right. There are only uh, five exceptions I know of that put some restrictions on it. So, right. but, but for the most part across the nation, it's, uh, yeah, just make sure that your waiver's up to date. Absolutely. Anything else going on that's fun? How many people you train in these days, Road? Not you know, not a huge number. Uh, just because I because I do quite a bit of uh, legal work, I really don't have a lot of time yeah, to train. Yeah, you have so, kind of a day job, don't you? Yeah, exactly. So and and I I don't even have a lot of try, time to train myself, let alone others. But right. so I don't advertise at all. Uh, but yeah, I've I've had quite a few over the past year. Uh, just mm -hmm. all finding through the website. Right. So it's uh, so at least coaches are busy everywhere. There is one. He's busy. She's that that busy. is that There's... is that is absolutely the truth. Yeah. yeah it, it's uh, I mean I literally if if I do zero advertising and I actually have to set appointments in the future <laughs> because I've got enough of them. Right. Uh, that just shows you the power of the credential. I mean I'm I'm yeah. I'm in in a lot of ways I'm sort of you know, the worst coach ever in terms of, uh, in terms of promoting the brand, but, uh, but, but yet it still seems to be uh, right. working. Those so. of you who are on the fence about coming to a seminar, uh, get off the fence, learn your craft, get some experience, read the books, train the model, practice training the model, and come to the seminar, get your credential and join the club. We're all working. And uh, I think all everybody with, with their credential will all tell you the same thing, that it's been an extremely big contribution to their professional uh, life. And uh, uh, we are in the process of trying to grow. We're not going to grow at the expense of our quality, but there is a demand for this, for this product, the starting strength coach credential and the work that we do that far outstrips the current supply of coaches. So get off the fence. Come join us at a seminar. Brody, mm -hmm. thank you. Thank Pre you. Appreciate the time, and uh, we'll see you here in a couple of months at the convention. And thank you as well for watching the podcast. We'll see you next time.